Hello, my name is Rinwa Hakim, and you are watching the Arabic Hour. Our program today features a Skype interview with Dr. Janice J. Terry, Professor Emeritus of History at Eastern Michigan University. Professor Terry currently serves as an adjunct professor at Marietta College, Ohio. Among her many accomplishments include serving as a former editor of Arab Studies Quarterly, a journal founded by Edward Said and Ibrahim Abu Lahoud, and is currently published by Pluto Press. Additionally, Dr. Terry had published numerous articles on Arab regional issues and has been a longtime voice for justice in the Middle East. Her publications include the titles U.S. Foreign Policy in the Middle East, The Role of Lobbies and Special Interest Groups, and The Wafat, 1919 to 1952, Cornerstone of Egyptian Political Power. Additionally, she is the co-author of World History, 5th edition, and the 20th Century and Beyond, 7th edition, and the co-editor and contributor of World War History, 7 volumes. Today, Professor Terry will discuss her most recent book, William Yale, Witness to Partition in the Middle East, World War I to World War II, via Skype with Arabic Hours' Elaine Hagopian. Uh, thank you, Renwa, and we are happy today to, to have the author of this new book on William Yale with us today to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Palestine, which we don't do very often these days, and we're going to do it through the life of William Yale. Uh, Janice Terry has uh, looked at some of his uh, own papers, and, and uh, the book is drawn primarily from those papers, but also from the papers and documents in other libraries um, by other people who served uh, during that period, especially on the King Crane Commission. Um, we're going to uh, really focus a lot on the King Crane Commission, which was in 1919. It was a commission that Wilson uh, sent abroad, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But first, Janice, welcome to the program, and tell us who was William Yale, and why should we be interested in learning about his life? Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Elaine. Always good to talk with you. Yale was a um, interesting fellow who had a very long life. He came from uh, the Anglo elite on the East Coast, uh, grew up uh, with great wealth, uh, a member of the Yale family of the university, although not a direct uh, heir. And um, he went to Yale, not surprisingly, but at the time he was in university, uh, his father lost his entire fortune. So while he had grown up with wealth, knew many, many wealthy people, he would never again be wealthy himself. And as a result of that, then he had to work for a living, uh, something that one gets the idea that many people in his family didn't have to do. And as a result of that, then he had many what he called his adventures. He worked on the Panama Canal as a way of making enough money so he could finish university. Then he joined what became the Standard Oil Company, Rockefeller's Company, who had what was essentially a, a school for uh, foreign officers for the, their company. So in many ways, the, the Standard Oil Company, even today, uh, has, if you will, uh, people on the ground that in many cases are better informed than uh, people in Washington. Was, uh, he, was Yale trained in oil exploration or was he just the, the, thought that, that he could do the job? The course. That was part of the course that uh, he uh, learned about oil exploration, drilling, um, and in fact went out to the fields of Oklahoma. Uh, saying that, in fact, you could study in school, but he always liked to be in the action. And so uh, they sent him out for about a year uh, to the fields of Oklahoma, but he also visited oil fields that were active and are coming online again in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And then they called him back um, and sent him out uh, to what was then the Ottoman Empire uh, because they were drilling in uh are, are hoping to find oil uh, to drill in what's today Turkey and the Balkans. What year, what year was he sent to that area? Well, this was before uh, the war actually began. You're talking about 1914. But then he was in the Middle East when the war actually broke out. He was actually in Palestine at the time that the war actually broke out. 
and the book starts with him telling about uh, uh, the difficulties that, in fact, they had some uh, British people that were a part of the team that was sent out by Standard Oil, and then getting them out once the the British came into the war against uh, the Ottoman or the Ottoman Empire came into the war against the British, more uh, precisely. Uh, there was, uh, of course, they had to get these people out of Palestine. And then ultimately Yale and the rest of the team left Palestine as well as the war got closer and closer to them. And it, yeah, go ahead, please. it became clear to Standard Oil that, you know, they weren't going to be able to do any explorations or anything while the war raged. And they had already set up, it's very interesting, they had already made contracts um, in the case of Palestine with several Palestinians um, and had concessions uh, legally drawn up that once the war was over, they anticipated going back to Palestine, and of course they wanted to go elsewhere in the Middle East uh, to start drilling for what they hoped would be, you know, big finds. Well, obviously there was a competition between all the big powers, not only for oil, but in that area, and Yale was interested in American uh, interests. But uh, let's let's jump ahead to the uh, war and talk a little bit about the context in which Yale finally begins to be a part of some of the uh, so-called diplomacy or commissions, fact-finding commissions related to Palestine. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the three, three uh, um, agreements that were made and remind our audience about them. One was the 1915 Hussein McMahon uh, agreement, uh, letters actually. Uh, in 1916 you had the Sykes-Picot agreement and uh, in 1917 you had the Balfour Declaration. These three documents all contradicted each other but committed uh, Great Britain and, and the powers um, to, certain, uh, uh, to certain activities. So if you could just briefly, because we don't want to dwell on them too long, summarize what each one was and why they were uh, contradictory and why they caused problems. Well, uh, it, it's the crux of the problem, really. The first deal, the, the Sykes-Picot, was a secret. Uh, or excuse me, the first deal was a series, as you point out, of letters with uh, Sharif Hussein was uh, a leading Arab figure. Um, and essentially what it said was that the Arabs would rise up and fight against uh, the Ottoman Empire, against the Central Powers. They'd fight on the side of the British and the French uh, in exchange for an independent state when the war was over. And note that they weren't talking about half a dozen independent states. They were talking about one independent state. Uh, and a kind of Arabian state of which yes. Palestine would be a part. Absolutely. The only parts that weren't um, definitely included were um, what would be essentially Iraq today. The British already knew there was oil in Iraq, and they intended to have it for themselves when the war was over. Uh, the French wanted Lebanon, and uh, Sharif Hussein said, well, you know, we'll leave Lebanon uh, essentially on hold until after the war. Um, Sharif Hussein figured that uh, two things. One, that the British were acting in good faith, which turned out not to be uh, the case. And that two, the, the overwhelming majority of the people in all of the area that he talked about were Arabs. And so uh, on the basis of what became you know, known by the United States as self-determination, he assumed that these territories would become part of the Arab state. And the result was that, uh, per the agreement, the Arabs did rise up and fight uh, with the British, uh, the Lawrence of Arabia story. And I would like to make a point here before you talk about Sykes-Picot, um, and that is that for the Arabs to agree to this, uh, to fight against other Muslims, the Ottoman uh, Empire, uh, was a huge uh, decision because it went towards ethnic nationalism as opposed towards the, um, the larger Muslim uh, society. So this was a very important step for the Arabs, and, but they felt that they were going to get their own state, including Palestine. 
So yes, let's that's talk, a great point. Let's talk a little bit about what Sykes Pico uh, said and then what the Balfour Declaration, which most people know. So let's do that briefly. Well, the Sykes Pico was essentially another secret deal, this time between the British and the French, um, although the Russians were tangentially involved yeah. because the Russians at that point were part of the Allied before the uh, Russian Revolution. And it essentially divided the territory that the British had just promised to the Arabs. And what it essentially said was that the British were going to get control over what today is Iraq and what today is uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And the French would get control over what today is Lebanon and Syria. And so what you're doing then is not only are you not giving the Arabs an independent state, you're dividing the state and you're dividing it between two separate uh, governing powers. So that this was, in fact, a double deal, obviously, and it was bound to make difficulties and indeed has up until the present day. And then it was exacerbated by the Balfour Declaration. Right. Yeah, and which, uh, and uh, you talked about this being uh, d dividing up, and you mentioned Israel, which at that time, of course, you meant Palestine. It was Palestine. Uh, and so let's now go on to the uh, Balfour Declaration, which is yet another contradiction to the 1915 letters. Yes, it's 1917, and it's different, in the, first of all, in the sense that it's a public statement as opposed to the two secret deals. And it essentially, it's only a paragraph long, and essentially said that the British government uh, viewed with favor the establishment of a, a Jewish homeland um, in uh, Palestine. Now, they purposely used these words that uh, can be interpreted differently uh, on purpose. Um, I've seen the various uh, legal legal uh, attempts to define it, yes. Yes, and uh, they, they went over each and every word, so there's nothing in the Balfour Declaration that's there by accident. But essentially, by promising, um, in one way or another, uh, P Palestine for a Jewish state, you had now sold the same house to three different people. You'd sold it to the Arabs, the British, and the Zionists. And, uh, of course, keep in mind when the British did this, they didn't control one square inch of any of this territory. So not only were they selling the house, they didn't own the house. And so it's not at all surprising that it continues uh, to be a problem until uh, the present day. <laughs> and then uh, later we then uh, get into, as things um, heat up in the area, uh, the war comes to an end. Uh, the, the, they go to Paris, and really the uh, fate of Palestine was already uh, decided by Wilson, President Wilson, uh, and others, though he spoke about self-determination uh, and so forth. And what he was pressured into doing, and the other powers didn't really join him, was to establish a commission, the King Crane Commission, to investigate what the people of the area uh, wanted uh, uh, as their solution. And uh, Yale was appointed the advisor, one of the advisors uh, to this commission. So talk a little bit about the King Crane Commission and what it came up with and what Yale came up with uh, in terms of his memorandum uh, as, as an advisor. Well, the King Crane Commission, uh, all Americans, uh, go out to find out uh, what the people wanted, which was in keeping with the idea of self-determination. And it, it's ironic and, and really tragic that at that point in t history, the United States was hands down the most popular country in, on earth. And certainly in uh, all of the Arab world, uh, the United States and Americans were looked to as the, 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 the force that would in fact provide independence and so they believed Wilson when he said self-determination and thought it meant them. Well, as it turns out, it didn't uh, mean uh, them. But the King Crane Commission went out and asked the people, novel idea, what they wanted. And overwhelmingly, we're talking in the 98 percentiles, the people said they wanted independence. Um, and 
So the King Crane Commission did an honest job. Um, King and Crane were both very admirable uh, men. And it wrote a very long and detailed and excellent report based on facts and submitted it with um, enormous amounts of statistics of who said what, when, and uh, you know what areas were in favor and what they wanted, etc. Um, and they came up with the idea that they wanted independence, which everyone knew. And that if they couldn't have independence, interestingly, they would accept reluctantly a temporary mandate or control by the United States as kind of a... a, a because they trusted the United, they thought yes, the United exactly, States was, exactly. was a and neutral if they power. Have that, if they couldn't have that, they'd take the British. Under no circumstances did they want uh, the, the French. And the overwhelming majority were against a, a Jewish state as well. And in fact, the only people that favored the idea of a Jewish state were the, the small number of Zionist settlers in Palestine at the time. And the King Crane Commission was very honest and interviewed them at great length as well about what they wanted. But since they were such a very small percentage of the population on the basis of self-determination, the King Crane Commission recommended independence uh, for the entire area, but especially for Palestine. So basically, they're also saying that if they couldn't be part of a greater Syria, a larger state, that they would like an independent Palestine. Yes. Uh, and in lieu of that, they would like a, a kind of mandate period under the U.S. Uh, go on and tell us what happened after that. Well, the, the King Crane com comes back and writes up a, what is a very fine report. But by that time, of course, Wilson uh, was already ill. He hadn't yet had the, the uh, dreadful stroke, but uh, was not a well man. And he, in fact, wasn't even in Paris when the King Crane Commission got back. And when they submitted their report, and we know because we have the, the facts about it, that the report was in fact delivered to the White House, that uh, it was available uh, not only to the White House, but to the State Department, etc. But it's not at all clear whether Wilson actually ever read the report. Uh, other people in the, in the White House and the State Department clearly did read the report, and they frankly didn't like what the report said because it told what the people wanted, and it wasn't in fact what the political forces wanted. And so, in fact, the report uh, sunk to the bottom uh, and wasn't even in fact uh, published for uh, over a decade after it was actually uh, submitted. Uh, which is really one of the, the tragedies because, in fact, had the report uh, and its recommendations been followed uh, more closely, I think uh, it's certain that many of the difficulties that we see today in the region would not uh, be the case. Now, tell us about Yale's uh, memo and what, well, he, what he submitted as, 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 as opposed to what the uh, commissioners submitted. Yes. Well, he didn't actually submit it formally because he was just an advisor. So there was one report. Uh, and although some people then who liked what Yale said called it the minority report, it wasn't a minority report. It was just his idea. Uh, and at that point, he did not favor the idea of an independent Palestinian state. Uh, which, which let me just pause for a minute to say that that is something that most people don't realize because Yale had quite a reputation in his older years uh, and I think your book really exposes uh, this and you didn't find this memo among his papers did you? You found it elsewhere. Yes, uh, it's quite clear that um, as the years went by and in fact not very many that Yale came to regret that he hadn't signed, well, he had signed on, but hadn't really supported the idea of the uh, King Crane recommendations for uh, an independent uh, Palestine or an independent Arab state. Um, and that while he had said that he thought that the encouragement of the Zionist enterprise uh, in his minority uh, discussion was a good thing, he came to regret that decision and saw that he had been uh, erroneous uh, in his conclusions that um, he had 
somehow felt that the, the Zionist enterprise uh, was not going to create an independent state that would uh, marginalize the Palestinians. That uh, somehow, and it's a mystery to me and many others, how yeah. he thought that uh, it wasn't going to marginalize the Palestinians. But uh, be that as it may, uh, in 1919, that's what he uh, thought. I think that as early as the early 20s, he had already begun to reconsider that. And as, in fact, the Zionist enterprise and, and Israel itself not only marginalized the Palestinians, but in fact ousted them, um, one um, directly or indirectly, um, and uh, did not provide any kind of binational um, enterprise. He then very much regretted that uh, he hadn't um, supported the uh, king. Not that I think that if he had supported it, it would have made any difference in terms of what the U.S. government did. No, that's true, but it, it's just very interesting that this person uh, was always seen as a champion of Palestinian uh, self-determination, which he really wasn't uh, at In that the beginning, time. that's absolutely yeah. true. Uh, well, in 1920, we had the San Remo um, uh, meetings, and uh, out of this, of course, grew the League, uh, Le League of Nations and the mandate system. And um, already the British had a high commissioner uh, in Palestine, uh, Herbert Samuel, um, who uh, really was taking actions in support of establishing a Jewish uh, state there. Now, the Arabs uh, uh, understood the mandate system as a new way of colonizing them, recolonizing them, and they were very much concerned about, uh, about this. Uh, but the actual mandate um, didn't take place in Palestine, though it, it seemed to be 1920 when the League was established, till, till, uh, a year to, till a couple of years later. Uh, but by this time, you're beginning to have more immigration and um, preferences given to a Zionist uh, organization or Zionist party that eventually became the basis for the uh, Knesset. You are watching an interview with Dr. Janice J. Terry regarding her recent book and her activism for justice in the Middle East. Stay tuned, there's more to come after this short program ID. You are watching the Arabic Hour, a program of news, views, culture, cuisine, and the Arab American experience. To view today's program or any previous program, log on to our website at www.arabichour.org. Tell us a little bit about the mandate years under the British while the um, while the Zionist effort was developing within Palestine itself and increasing its population, which really uh, was very small uh, back in the days of World War One. So yes, well, you were, we're talking about the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. Yes. Yes. And what essentially happened is that the British were on top. It's kind of a tri tri-cornered struggle with the British on the top, the Zionists who want an independent Jewish state, and the Palestinians who want an independent Palestinian state. The Zionists and the Palestinians were always, sometimes uh, politically, sometimes uh, economically, sometimes militarily, against one another. And the British, frankly, played both sides against the middle to keep themselves on top. But there's no doubt that by permitting uh, and sometimes encouraging increased Jewish immigration into the country, um, the odds were stacked in favor of the Zionist enterprise. And so the Jewish population in Palestine increased um, to about a third of the total uh, population. And the Palestinians never accepted this, always struggled um, either directly or indirectly uh, against it, but they were by far the weaker um, party. And, uh, of course, then with World War uh, II, uh, became even weaker. Yes, uh, tell us uh, now, after World War II, uh, 
Uh, and even before World War II, when things were heating up in Palestine, the conflict was uh, between these two national parties uh, were taking place. The, the British uh, had what they call the uh, Peel Commission, which uh, talked about uh, partition, and the Zionists favored it as any way to get a foothold uh, in Palestine. And they really wanted, uh, as the literature shows, the British to actually transfer uh, Palestinians to uh, parts of uh, uh, northern Syria and Iraq, uh, and they were they were hoping that uh, they would that the British would do the dirty work. In any case, it didn't happen, and World War II broke out. And after World War II, the British were really uh, exhausted and uh, didn't know really what to do with with Palestine. Turned it over to the UN, and an Anglo-American commission committee was formed to go and explore what should be done. Uh, and they gave their report in 1946. Uh, tell us what this report said, and then what action, if any, was taken on it. Well, it's an interesting thing. There were actually uh, three reports in the sense that the State Department had uh, already developed, and there's stacks of uh, recommendations, uh, where they went through all the variables. If there was a Jewish state, if there were a binational state, if there were a Palestinian state, what would happen, uh, what the United States policy should be. And the Anglo-American Commission went out and essentially found exactly the same thing the King Crane Commission had found uh, that the people wanted an independent Arab state and that the minority, uh, the Zionists, wanted an independent uh, Jewish state and that it was quite clear that uh, partition uh, was going not really to be accepted by any group, although the Zionists politically very wisely said that they would accept partition. It as was a tactical point. move. Yeah. Yes, a tactical. It's a foot in the door. Better, as Ben Gurion said, a, a small state uh, to start, uh, and note it was to start, uh, at, rather than none. Um, the Palestinians, for obvious reasons, since they, they owned 90-some percent of the land, uh, were uh, over two-thirds of the population of the country, uh, opposed uh, partition and a Jewish uh, state, that it was their state, they, they were the majority, they owned uh, the state, essentially, uh, and they said so, and everyone knew that. So what you essentially had was then you had the, Amer the, the State Department that knew the facts on the ground saying that a partition wouldn't work, that a Jewish state was going to cause uh, trouble. You have the Anglo-American uh, Commission that says exactly the same thing. And then you had a third commission. It's almost as if the politicians didn't like what the commissions were finding out, so they kept sending them out till they'd get somebody that would say what they did want. Well... The third group, Morris and Grady, said exactly the same thing, that this was going to cause uh, a war. Uh, they didn't put it quite that bluntly, but that's essentially uh, their uh, conclusion to this. But as you know, uh, lamentably, what happens is that the politicians make the decisions and uh, the recommendations of the experts on the ground are ignored. And so, in fact... Uh, the UN, uh, with the uh, really the pressure of the United States, uh, voted for partition uh, that everyone on the ground knew was going to cause uh, a war, and indeed it did. And indeed, the partition uh, was never implemented. Uh, war broke out, and the Zionists, which had said to the, I mean Ben Gurion had said to his followers, "Look, we will get a little piece of land. It will be legal." and we can expand from there. And, and there are several letters to his uh, son and to, uh, to his followers and speeches he made indicating that expansion would, uh, would follow and that they would get what they wanted uh, by periodic expansion and cleansing. Um, so we know that uh, 181, the partition plan, was never implemented. War breaks out and uh, 48 war after the Zionists declared their independence and drew on the wording 
from the partition plan that called for a Jewish state, but ignored the part that called for a, an Arab state. Um, so we're, we, we know from that point on what happened. We know that early on the British interests were in having a uh, Jewish state that they could have as a client, and apparently the Americans fell into the same uh, position. But you're an expert on uh, American foreign policy. You've written on it. Um, so rather than go over the period from 48 to the present, uh, let us uh, deal with the present. We now have uh, Palestine under total occupation from 48 to the present. And people differentiate between uh, 48, in which uh, the Zionists got 78%, and 67, which is now called the Occupied Territories, but in fact is being eaten up. So all of Palestine is really uh, in the control of the Zionists. The Americans um, haven't uh, been helpful. Oslo was a means by which Palestinians lost more. Given the fact, however, that we are very close to having the Iran-American uh, agreement confirmed if, if unless Congress comes up with more numbers to defeat it. Uh, how will this uh, affect the possibilities for Palestine over the years, not immediately, but over the years? What, what, what do you think will happen if, if Iran becomes a part of the sort of comity of nations uh, in that area? Well, frankly, Elaine, I'm uh, not certain that the Iran uh, agreement uh, will make a, a tangible difference in terms of U.S. policy, because uh, what we've essentially seen, and it's now been 100 years, and Yale is, is uh, a, a, an example of this, of where experts and people that know the region say what the facts are on the ground are and what the results will be if certain decisions are made. And that what we've seen for a hundred years uh, from King Crane to the Insti present. Institutionalized. Really. Yes, it's, yes, exactly. Is that uh, the United States is not a neutral observer. It's a participant, a partisan in the Arab-Israeli conflict and a partisan on the side of Israel and has been for a hundred years in spite of the fact that the experts for a hundred years have said that this is not in the best interests of the United States or the best interests of U.S. foreign policy. So essentially what it is that politics takes precedence over principle, over in fact even the best interests of the United States. And I think personally that that will continue to be the case until we as Americans, as citizens, as voters, uh, make it uh, apparent to the politicians that there's a cost for this and that we want to do not only what is moral and the, the principal thing to do, but in fact what is in our own best interests. So that should be in fact a win-win that we're supporting what is a moral thing to do, but also it's in our own best interests. But I don't think that's going to happen until um, the American public, in mm -hmm. uh, enough numbers, uh, puts pressure on politicians. Yeah. I think a lot of people agree with you, but there is also, um, and it seems to be some sort of uh, attempt uh, not to not to uh, act on principle, but to use the European Union uh, in order to try to keep promoting what is already dead, a two-state solution. And now that would mean an even uh, even greater Bantustan, uh, Bantustan, Bantustan uh, areas in, within the West Bank especially. Um, more to just finish the, the problem, just to get rid of it. It would not be a solution, but you can see that the European Union keeps pressing for this. And uh, I find that uh, that uh, uh, interesting. Um, is that uh, a possibility that 
They'll keep pushing for this to just finish with the problem, but it would not be a solution. Um, well, I, I think there are certainly, as you, you point out, forces that, that want that. But I do think that the, the boycott divestment uh, process that uh, is gaining support within the United States it is a, a means whereby not only can we debate these issues and should debate them in, in corridors of power, but for people to begin to reconsider and to engage in uh, the conflict. And I think it, it's hopeful that many young Jewish Americans um, see uh, the um, inequality, the, the immorality, really, of the policies in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict, not only in terms of what Israel has done, but what the United States uh, has done. And that uh, mobilization and um, involvement uh, um, making politicians aware that there are people, um, just as the, the Zionist lobby has done so effectively, uh, that there's costs to be had politically um, if, in fact, we don't take a more balanced um, moral approach. Mm -hmm. and, I, I am reminded of the anti-Vietnam movement, which actually took years yes. to develop. And until it actually became a mass movement which did have clout in terms of votes and in terms of political action in the United States. We had no real action on Vietnam. So uh, the, the BDS movement, while it really hasn't hurt the economy of Israel, it has really made them fearful of restricting um, movements of their academics and others. Uh, in the world as it becomes increasingly popular. And as the, um, as the movement of uh, uh, Jewish people of principle who have become aware of what Israel is, this is a nucleus which yet has to be developed over years. But basically uh, what I think you're saying, what I agree with, is this action is not going to come simply because there's um, there's an agreement. I think that the uh, Iran thing will attempt to stabilize the area more, but it may be uh, a kind of stabilization that is not necessarily in the interest of Palestinians or of the Arabs for that matter. Um, tell me, before we close, um, is there something you would like to tell our audience or talk about? Um, and um, say about your book? Well, I think that the Yale book is a way to, for us as uh, Americans to engage in the debate uh, regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict and uh, the errors that we as a, a country, as, as a polity, have made regarding the Arab-Israeli conflict and the, the Arab world in general. And that I hope then it, it is a means whereby more of us uh, perhaps people that are sympathetic but have been on the fence or uh, choose not to speak out will become more actively involved. One of the big problems in the United States is that most Americans are not involved with uh, foreign policy and do not, in fact, uh, uh, They don't know anything about it. Yes. And so this is a huge problem, unless, of course, Americans are being killed uh, on the field. Uh, then uh, uh, Americans become involved in, in issues involving foreign policy. But this is, in fact, a, a very uh, counterproductive thing because in, it, what it has done, especially in the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's left a very small minority of um, active and committed people, Zionists, uh, to carry the day um, for now a uh, 100 years. And that... Um, shame on us uh, as a, a, a political force that we, in fact, as citizens, haven't uh, involved ourselves and encouraged then our governments, um, but most of all our politicians, uh, to take stands that are in our best interests and our moral stands as well. Well, we thank you. And I want to encourage our listeners to uh, get this book and to read it. It's a piece of very important history and it will tell you something about the way in which American foreign policy uh, developed around the issue 
of Palestine and the Middle East. Uh, Janice, um, thank you very much for being on Arabic Hour. I hope we'll have an opportunity to talk to you again. And um, I, I wish you well. Enjoy the rest of the season. Take care. Thank you very much. Right. Always a pleasure. Right. Bye now. That was an interview with Dr. Janice J. Terry via Skype regarding her most recent book, William Yale, Witness to Partition in the Middle East, World War I to World War II. You are watching the Arabic Hour, a program of news, views, culture, cuisine, and the Arab American experience. To view today's program or any previous program, log on to our website at www.arabichour.org. Thank you so much for joining us at the Arabic Hour today. Some stations will be leaving us, and we look forward to seeing you next week. For those of you staying with us for the remainder of the hour, we hope you enjoy the last musical segment following the closing credits. On behalf of all of the volunteers here at the Arabic Hour, this is Ghinwa Hakim, and I look forward to seeing you next week. The Arabic Hour has been brought to you in part by the William G. Abdullah Memorial Library, a resource center for information and education on the Arab American experience. The American Arabic Benevolent Association, an umbrella organization for community endeavors. The Nicholas G. Barham Veterans Association and Ladies Auxiliary, providing veteran services, scholarships with community pride. And by our members as well as contributions by viewers like you.